want him to be. You know, it's not always the good move. It's not always the good feeling. But when God's doing something in your life, it, it causes strife sometimes. It causes pain. It causes suffering. Why? Because he's bringing us closer to him. And this morning, we're going to, I know that many of us have been facing some type of, of battle, some type of fight. And I'm not talking about with your spouse or with your children or with your dog because he keeps digging holes in the backyard. <laughs> but now we're talking about spiritual fight, a spiritual warfare, something that we're all familiar with from time to time. Because sometimes we can kind of get the devil, he comes into our life and he wants to cause, try to cause confusion or he wants to get our minds off of God and he wants to put our minds on our health, on our sickness, on our families, our well-beings, our finances, you know, all this other stuff that shouldn't be of that much of consideration knowing that God has control of all of it. And so when this happens, we have to understand if, how do we fight our battles? So the message of this title, the title of the message is, this is how I fight my battles. And this is how we fight our battles. Because we have to understand that it's not, this is how much I know. And this is how much I understand. It's knowing who you are and who we are grounded under. Who are we grounded in this morning? Because if we're grounded in, our, in ourselves and our achievements, that only goes so far. Because now when we're being threatened by our lives, being threatened by our health, by something that's out of our control, then there goes our confidence. There goes our hope. There goes everything because we can't fix that ourselves. We have to rely on a doctor. We have to rely on a diagnosis. We have to rely on something that's going to give us some type of hope saying, yes, we have medication for this. But what about when that medication is not available? What about the doctors looking at you in your eyes and has that worried look and saying, I don't know how we're going to stop this. This is when we have to learn not to look at what's in front of us and what a doctor can give, what he can prescribe, but what God can do for us and how he can bring a healing, no matter how big of a healing is needed. But no, any healing is possible through Jesus. There's no such thing as, as the impossible. For us, yes, there is the impossible, for, but for God, he's the God of the impossible. He can do it. And then we go into prayer and we go into a place of, well, Lord, I don't know how you did this. Well, that's the thing we don't know, but God is a God of miracles. And so we're going to be going in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 this morning, we're going to be talking about the armor of God. Why? Because we need to set ourselves up in battle, knowing exactly what we need to do and what we've been equipped with this morning. Because if we don't know what we're equipped with this morning, all we're doing is just swinging. We're just swinging and we're hoping that we're going to make that knockout punch and that it's going to be all over with and then go into the next one. Father, this morning, Lord, we just thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, for the Holy Spirit, O oh Lord. I pray this morning, God, that you have your way. Let there be a stirring in our hearts, God. I pray, give us clarity and understanding of your word. Father, have your way this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6. I, I'm throwing, this, this, we're going to throw this one in. We're not going to get started right on the armor of God, but this is going to be beneficial for all of us right here. <laughs> Children, okay? <laughs> so if you're living with your parents, you're a child. <laughs> Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Why? Because we all have that saying, I brought you into this world and I could take you out, right? <laughs> Mama said that plenty of time. Sometimes daddies say that too. Like, I brought you in, I could take you out easily, okay? But it's saying parents in the Lord. Because when the parents in the Lord, when they're telling us to do something, that we may not like, they're giving us direction because they're God-fearing parents. So they're not going to tell you anything that's bad for you. They're going to tell you nothing but that's good for you, to help you grow, to help you learn life lessons without having to go through all the headaches and trials. So we're talking about parents that are trusting in God. 
Because we have other parents that we may have grown up with that, hey, you better go beat up that boy. He just smacked you upside your head. If you want that Snickers bar, you're going to have to figure out how to get it. And if you want it that bad, just go get it and put it in your pocket. We're not talking about that type of direction. But we're talking about the godly direction that will, a parent that fears God that will give you, that will help you escape all the headaches that life has to offer you. What they speak to you and the advice that they give will help you as they live their lives for Christ. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in training, admonishing of the Lord. I mean, don't cause your kids, don't cause them to get angry, don't, don't stir them up. Don't try them to go fight each other, but yet teach them God's love. Teach them how to fear God in the right way, but yet to love him sincerely with all heart, to know who God is. Going on, it says, bond servants, be obedient to those who are masters, to, who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. Now we're talking about leadership. Now we're talking about the church. Now we're talking about those that are above you that are there for you. They're there trying to help you out. They're, they're trying, to, trying to do it. When, when you say you're going to give a service to them, you're not doing it just to, just to get extra points. You're not doing it to get extra cookies, chocolate chip cookies, okay? That, that's my favorite, chocolate chip. You're not doing it because you're going to look good, but you're doing this because you see it as a service to Christ, and you're doing it because of your obedience. That, this, is, this is called submission, submission unto one another. Bond servants is meaning servants in the King James translation, and when it's talking about obedience in verse 5, it's saying of slaves to their masters. So as leaders look out for us, as leaders look out for me and you, teaching and giving what is needed. You know, if we're trying to, trying to help them out, we're going to do it because God, God has put, us, put on our heart to do so. That means when they ask us to do something, we're not going to get all bitter about it. Why? Because we're doing it unto God. We're not doing it to please them. We're not doing it because, oh, we want to be number one friends on Facebook, on Instagram, if you couldn't even do that. We're doing it because this is part of our hearts. This is what we want to do. Because we know when the first thing that they tell us when we don't like, what do we do? Uh, we start talking. We start saying, well, I don't think so. I don't think it works good this way. Or I don't think it should be done that way. This, then what heart are you doing it out of? This is what we have to ask ourselves. Because we all have ideas, but if we're doing it, submitting unto God, and helping out, then you're just going to do it knowing that God is going to hold them accountable. And that's just it. God's not going to hold you accountable because you're just submitting. The leader or whoever that you're submitting to is going to be the one that God is going to deal with. So you're clear. You're good. You're in an okay zone. That's the best part. Now moving on to verse 9, it says, And you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. So it's saying, look, and if you're a leader, you do the same for them without threatening. That means if you don't do this, well, then, you know what, you can't be part of this. And giving direct threats and saying, you know what, if you can't do this, well, then you just don't get this. You can't treat people that way. You can't come in and give people what you're feeling. Leaders serving others. Being a leader doesn't mean that you're being bossy. Doesn't mean that you could be bossy. Doesn't mean that, you know what, I'm the pastor, so I, I, I got to feel what, what I got to do today in order to, uh, uh, according to what I feel. No, it's according to what God is wanting. Oh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm this and I'm that and using power of position to come in and feel like doing what you want. We can't do that. We can't allow the enemy to come in and stir us up in the wrong ways to where we think we're something big and bad. 
Because it happens from time to time. Pride comes in and it stirs us up. And we're thinking that we're doing something good. But yet, it turns out not being that good. We convince ourselves that it's right, but in reality, it's not right. And we have to be careful because there's a, have you ever heard that oldie song? There's a fine line between, or a thin line between love and hate. There's a thin line between being a good leader and a follower. There's, there's, a, there's that fine line. Because we have to be able to discern and know what's right from wrong. And sometimes we don't have that much time to even think about it. It's just you got to act on it. And you got to do it. But you got to do it out of the righteousness of how God wants you to do it. And this is why it's important that we have that relationship with God to know that we're making those right decisions. Going on verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Talk about the devil bringing in all the evil craftiness, his methods, his evil doing, so that you're able to stand against it. To stand. Stand is meaning to stand fast against an enemy as opposed to running away. Meaning that once the enemy begins to come in, you're going to stand up to it no matter what. You're not going to think twice about it because it's already been instilled in you when something bad is coming your way, whether you're before you got saved, if something bad was coming your way, what did you do? You, you stood up to it. You didn't think twice about it. You thought, we thought that we could handle it with our hands. We thought we could just do it like that with a snap of a finger, we'll react and we'll do it. In the same way that as we walk our lives out, when the enemy begins to come in and start messing with you, when the enemy starts coming in and start messing with your family, it's not a time to say, well, you know what, it's not that bad just yet. But when it gets bad, I'm going to step in and start dedicating some time. No, you got to stand up now. You got to stand up at that point in time and say, you know what, not this time, not ever. But sometimes we can get comfortable. We could get comfortable and say, you know, it's not that bad. I, I noticed that, but that got over with real quick. No, that's just a taste. Once you get a taste of that and the enemy begins just to mess with you, nah, stand up. Stand up and know who you are and rebuke him. And this is what we have to do. Because if he starts off with one thing, it's not going to stop there. He's probably waiting to see how you're going to react. He's probably waiting to see on how you're going to jump into that scenario. See, sometimes the enemy wants to come in and bring in thoughts, bring in, bring in evil desires, and we let them sit there, and we let them soak into our minds, and before we know it, we start thinking about it even more, and even sometimes we start acting it out, and we're like, well, where did this, when, when did this happen? How did this happen? How can I allow it? Well, you allowed it when you began to let the enemy just come in just little by little. And begin to poison your mind, to poison your, your thoughts, your hearts. We allow the enemy to come in and mess with us, sometimes unknowingly, because things just come and go and it didn't take an effect on us. We have to be ready to stand guard, no matter what, how big or small the scenario is. When the enemy starts to press in, it's a time to stand up. See, when the enemy comes in, he doesn't come in and he doesn't knock at the door of your heart saying, hey, uh, I'm going to go in and start messing with your life right now. So is it okay if I start now or do you want me to start next week? <laughs> he doesn't, the, the enemy doesn't come in and give common courtesy to us. So what, what, what are we going to do right when the enemy tries to mess with us? We're not going to give him common courtesy back. Oh, well, you didn't affect me hard this time. You didn't hurt me that much this time. No, you got to smack them back. You got to hit them back where it hurts. Well, how do you do that? You pray. You believe. You fight spiritually. You go into prayer. Going on verse 12, it says, For we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age 
against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. To withstand is meaning to stand against, to resist, whether in deed or in word. And it's talking about the whole armor of God. It's not talking about partial. Because sometimes we just want to swing the sword, and that's just it. We just want to put on a piece of equipment, and we just want to go with that just piece, and we think that everything's going to be fine. It says to go with the whole armor of God. Why? Because we're not dealing with people that are just in front of us. We're dealing with anything that, anything that is evil that is out there, spiritually speaking, that is more than what you really know. And if we don't know how bad it can get, it can get bad in a heartbeat. But I tell you one thing, when we were in the world, we didn't go out and fight 50%. We didn't go give 20%. If you've seen someone in front of you, you're going to give someone a beating. You give it your all. Whether you got in a fight the day before and you got a broken hand, you're still going to give 100% with the hand and your two feet. And maybe a couple of head bunts. It didn't stop you. You're going to give 100% no matter what. You go two broken hands, but you're still going to go out kicking. But you're giving it your all. And the same thing with God. you got to wear the whole armor. Why? Because it's designed to help keep you. It's designed to help keep us safe, to keep us sane, to keep us knowing who God truly is. When the enemy wants to press in, and begin to stir you up to do wrong, to begin to stir you up to just for, to forget everything and give up, to forget about God's goodness and what God was doing in your life before things begin to take a turn for the worse. We must almost always wear the armor of God. I shared this with the guys on Friday night. I shared it with them because it, it really, it really, it really did something for me. That day when, when my nose was bleeding and it wouldn't stop bleeding and I was spitting out clots and it just wouldn't stop. You could see the fear in the doctor's face. They couldn't stop the bleeding that was coming out. It was spit, getting spit out, going out through the other nostril and they could not find a way to stop it. The enemy began to, to come in and to lie and say, this is it. This is done. Look, not even the doctor can help you. Not even the doctor can save you. And here I am. My wife is sitting there helpless. All she can do is look while they stub, shove this thing about this big up my nose, hoping that the bleeding would stop. And here I am. Man, Lord, I don't know what's going on. I'm not going to tell you that I was brave. I'm not going to tell you that there was other thoughts that were going through my mind. You want to talk about being scared? I was scared. I'm not going to lie to you. But all I can do is say, Lord, if this is your will, then this is just it. And I had to believe it with all my heart. I had to grab a hold of God and say, Lord, if this is it, then this is just it. That I have no control over this. I have no control over nothing at all. What I thought I had control over, I don't have no control over. And the enemy wants to come in during our weakness, during the times when we're feeling weak, and he wants to taunt us, and he wants to tell us that you're done, that you're over with, that that's it. It's time to sign out. But we got to learn to go and cry to God and say, Lord, if this is you, then let it be done. But if it's not, then speak to me and give me peace during this time so that I can have hope, so that I can have some type of something to stand on. And yes, Lord, I believe in your word and I trust in it and I stand on it. But Lord, at times it gets hard and it gets heavy that I don't know how to do it just right right now. And then just for God just to have his way and bring peace. And know that, you know what, if he's in control, he's in control. And that's what gave me peace and satisfaction. I've never been so scared in my life. But this is a testimony for me. 
Never been so scared in my life. I've been shot up. I had knives pulled out me. That's nothing. But when there was no control, when there was no sense of hope, how God just comes in and sees you in the darkest of times and gives you that strength and brings that calmness upon you and lets you know that he's there with you, you cannot beat that. You cannot beat that. But when the enemy comes in, you have to know on how to fight. You have to know on where to start. You start by saying, Lord, help me. In my disbelief, help me because I'm being lied to. Help me because I'm feeling sick. Help me because I'm feeling weak. I don't know what I'm going to do. And he's going to come in. And he's going to speak to you. And it may not be something that's a quick fix, but I'm telling you something. It is something that you could stand on and hold on to and live to the next day. And this is how we begin to fight our battles, is giving it to God rather than trying to take it upon ourselves. Going on verse 14, it says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So here we are, we're talking about the armor of God now. We're talking about the belt of truth. Why? Because we got to know the truth. Why? Because the truth will what? Set us free. The truth will set us free. If we don't know the truth, we're going to be stuck in doubt. We will be stuck in fear. We will be stuck in not knowing it. And if we don't know, guess what? We go crazy. We take it out on other people. We take it out on our loved ones. Why? Because we don't know. John 8, verses 31 and 32, it says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is Jesus telling the Jews, the ones that believed in him. The same thing for us today. If we believe in him, and if we know the truth and we accept it, whether sometimes we don't want to accept the truth, but we accept it, we take it in, we're like, man, okay, Lord, I don't like it, but I'll take it. it. That's just what it is. You're telling the truth about me, you're telling the truth about your word and, and how it directs me and how it helps me. And when we know the truth, then we'll, we're okay. Then we're okay. You'll be okay. And it talks about the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is meaning man can only accept the claims of God upon his life as he repents of his sins and receives Christ as his or her savior by faith. Becoming a child of God, realizing God's claim upon him or her by the miraculous regenerating action of the Holy Spirit. Breastplate of righteousness, meaning you're not living according to your righteousness anymore. Knowing that God has claimed you as his child, your righteousness is, is con just like Paul said, what his knowledge and what he thought was considered dumb. Same thing as our righteousness of what we had. When we go to God and we say, Lord, my Savior, forgive me for my sins, and we take on his righteousness, now that means we're acting differently our approach is differently everything about us is different now and what we thought was good what we thought was us is no longer us the old man is gone but the new one is in and now we're talking about God's righteousness because when it's ourselves it doesn't do much for us maybe some people back off of us because they don't want to deal with us that's, that's the type of righteousness that we some had, some of us had. I don't want to go near him because, man, he, he's just a headache. Because he thinks he's right. He thinks that he's all good or she's all good and that she can't be touched. No one wants to deal with those type of people. God does. Thank God for that. He dealt with us, right? We're here. Amen? So he dealt with us. And he's still dealing with us. And it hasn't stopped. 
And he's saying, yeah, you think you're righteous, but yeah, you're wrong. And then he sends either a word to you, or you read scripture, or someone comes in and prays for you and just bluntly calls it out. Well, I don't think they know what they're saying. Yeah, but God was dealing with you the whole week. <laughs> and you still don't believe what that person was praying over you that day? Some of us are in complete denial. I mean, it's okay to deny, but deny the enemy, not, not God. Right? We got, we got to get on the opposite side of the road. Deny the enemy, accept Jesus. That's the, that's the only way that we're going to, like, people are going to tend to like us even more. Except for those that are stuck in their, in their ways, that don't want to hear nothing about God. Then it's like, whoa, stay away from me. I don't want to hear nothing of it. Verse 15, it says, And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Meaning preparations, meaning having a firm footing for the foundation of peace. The gospel, the gospel, and shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel, meaning to bind under, to put on as shoes or as sandals. Knowing the word that you stand on. Knowing what you stand on this morning. What do you stand on today? If you ask yourself, without looking to the person next to you, or without having to think about it so much, if someone wants to ask you today, this morning, what do you stand on today? What's your first response going to be? My job. Um, my family. My car. My finances. My health. My God is way out on the sideline. We stand on everything else, but God is like way over here. Oh, but... But when, uh, when trouble comes our way, we do the two-step, right? We do the two-step like this. Oh, God, here we are. I'm standing on you now because I need you today. But I'm good now. So I'm going to go ahead and step back over here and get back to my comfortness. There's one time, oh, I, I think I said it, but yeah. Sometimes we use God as a Sancho. As a Sancho. You know, we go to God because we're in need of something. We're in need of fix. And, and we need God to come in and just give us that, that, that rub on the head, fix that boo-boo, pat us on the back, and then send us off. And then we're good. And then he's no longer needed. He's no longer needed. Or we don't spend as much time as we would with him during that time of trouble. But now things have gotten better. Now our time from God has gotten distant. So the reason thing that the reason that God allows things to happen in our lives is because he wants to draw us closer to him. Not only that, but sometimes he wants to get a hold of us so that we can go deeper with him. And sometimes it's just because you ain't listening, so he has to send a flood your way, and he, he just brings in people that, to surround you to tell you that you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And then you want to forget about them, and you want to go to the people that tells you you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, but they're not even Christians. They're not, even, they're not even believing in God. But yet you would rather take in their advice and think that you're okay rather than listen to the people of God that are telling you you're wrong and get things right. It's funny how we work. And we jump from here to there at time to time. To say that we're consistent, 100%, always on God, that's maybe 99, maybe 95%. Some of us, 90% or 85. See, we have to realize where we stand today. Where we stand today. What are we standing on? What are we believing in? It says in verse 16, Above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fairy darts of the wicked one. The faith to stand. No matter what the enemy tells you, that you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins so that you can have an opportunity to make heaven your home. That's faith. That no one else died for my sins. No one else is going to take me to heaven. So I cannot allow anyone else to come into place of where my God needs to be. 
Nothing else shall come into that place. Not my wife. Not my ch- Nothing shall come into that place where God needs to be. God always comes first. Then your wife. Then your children. See, there's an order to God that we have to understand. If you're praying and your wife is coming in and you're really in deep prayer, and I have a question. I'm praying right now. I'll get back to you. When my wife's praying, oh, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't dealing with her. I'm going this way. <laughs> when I'm in the room and I'm getting a hold of God, she knows not to come in. Do not bother me. Do not come in and interrupt that time. Because the one thing is, if our relationship with God is where it needs to be, then we don't have to worry about the other person. If your spouse has a relationship with God that they're supposed to have, you don't have to worry about them. God's got a hold of them. If your children have that relationship with God that they're supposed to have, you don't have to worry about them. See, that's the one thing that we have to realize. If that person truly really has a relationship with God and you see it and it's evident, you don't have to worry about them. Why? Because they're always going to do according to what God wants. All they want to do is just please God. And if they're telling you to be quiet and leave me alone, I'm praying, I'm trying to get a hold of the Lord, by golly, you got something good. And you got to fight for it. How? Put on your armor. Go to God first and say, Lord, here I am. Help me to stay where I need to be. Because when God brings marriages together, when he brings relationships together, there's a commitment that's made unto him. And see, God is only the one, is the only one that's able to keep that commitment. It's not flowers. It's not chocolates. It's not like, oh, we're going to go on a sexy date night to wear your sexy dress. It's, it's, all that helps. But when God's in the middle, then that's what keeps you. Yeah, I had to keep it clean there. It is February, so it's, you know. All that's good, but if it ever loses its touch, then what? If it loses its touch or if there's too much, then what? Well, Lord, seems like you're the only one keeping us together. Well, he's been the only one keeping you together. <laughs> he's the only one keeping you together, let alone together as marriages and relationships and whatever else you have in your life. He's the only one keeping it together for you. But we don't recognize that. We take advantage of it at times. Going on verse 17, it says, And take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. The Lord is our light. And salvation, whom shall we fear? You got to believe this in your head. You got to understand this. You got to know who God truly is. The enemy will come in and try to mess it all up for you, but you got to know. you got to put on that helmet of salvation. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the one that gave you salvation. He's the only one that's given you hope, security. He's given you everything that has given you most of life or some of life, at least a peaceful part of life. Even when things are going crazy, he's still giving you peace through that process. Even when you're still needing the healing, he's still giving you peace through that time. Even when you don't know what's going to hap- happen tomorrow or the following week or there's a lot of worries that are going on. Knowing who you are in Christ and keeping that and understanding it will keep you safe and it will keep you sane. Going on, it says, continuing, praying always, oh wait, and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Which is the word of God. Sword of the spirit. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, for the word of God is living and active. Sharper than any two double-edged sword. You want to cut someone up? Calling them, call them names ain't going to help. I'll tell you one thing. If someone has a relationship with God, telling them what you feel, 
is not going to really do any damage to them. It'll probably anger them and upset them. But you give them scripture and you tell them this is what the Lord says, that, that's going to cut someone up. That's going to that's gonna cause pain. That's going to cause hurt. And they ain't going to be able to shake that off. You they may not like for a week or two, and they may like want to push you away, but the word of God is going to be stuck in them, and they cannot take that out. And that causes some uncomfortness. That makes you lose sleep. This is why it's important that when we give encouragement to each other, or when God has given you something to speak to someone else, bring in the word. Because they can reject you, but they can't reject the word. That's what I love about God's word. It's, it's once you know it, you can't go back. You go back, you're miserable. You, th- you think you're happy, but I'm telling you, you're not. Because I went back so many times in my life. You think you had it bad. Pastors looked at me. I shared this with the guys, too. Pastors looked at me and saying, man, this is one bad apple. I don't want to waste my time with this guy. I was one of those guys. I'll go to church one Sunday. I won't be back for a couple weeks, and I'll go back, and I'll go pray and ask God for his forgiveness. Then I won't go back again. Then I'll go back again. Then I won't go back again. They see me as a problem. They see me as a problem. They didn't want that. But the thing that kept bringing me back was because there's that pulling and because Even though I didn't know the word of God then, I heard scripture, whether it was in service, whether it was from someone else, like my wife, that she would not be quiet and say, well, the word says this, and I tell her, shut up, be quiet, leave me alone. Not because I was praying, because I didn't want to hear the word. But that stuck, and it stuck, and it stuck, and I could not get it out. And because the word of God is good and it sets us free. And once we know it more and more, now we're set free from bondage. That's what the word of God is good for. It cuts us open, it dissects us, and it takes all the bad out. And then we let in good to help us change. Verse 18, it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this, and with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Praying always with prayer and supplication in the spirit. Meaning, we're not just there just saying just random stuff. But when we get into the spirit, we're getting into a place of where our hearts are just being exposed. We're opening up and we're saying, Lord, I don't care what it is that you have to tell me. But just tell me because I have a lot of things I need to tell you. And being in that place of intimacy with God. Intimacy is meaning that you're sharing, that you're giving, that you're taking, and that you're applying And you're desiring it. And this is what we call being in in, in intimacy with God. You're taking everything, everything, whether you like it or not. And because he loves you, you're applying it to your life. You're applying it and you're saying, man, Lord, I don't know better. So you know better than me because you are the one that created me. You are the one that made me in your own image. So you know more than I do. And this is in the place that we have to understand and get to this morning. And I'm going to go ahead and close with that. And we have to remember this morning that when we fight our battles, it's not how strong we are physically. It's not how strong we are physically, mentally. It's how strong we are spiritually. Spiritually, because there's going to be a time when no one can help you. And you've got to know on how to cry out to God. You got to know where to start off at, where to stand. And even when the unknown comes in, just knowing that God is in control no matter what. And letting him have his way in that. Amen. Father, we just 